Thank you all. The night is beautiful, so the faces of my people. The stars are beautiful, so the eyes of my people. Beautiful also is the sun. Beautiful also are the souls of my people. Please excuse my self-indulgence, but I welcome any excuse to quote one of my favorite writers, the late as well as great Mr. Langston Hughes. I'm excited as well as honored and a little bit nervous to be here with you all. My deepest thanks to the Arts Foundation for this wonderful invitation to speak before you and to celebrate the work of the talented artists that are honored here tonight. I would like to use my time to talk about representation and to share with you three significant moments in my life. Number one, according to my older sister Karen, I was two years old, plunked in front of our black and white television, attempting to sing along to the theme of the kids' show, Here Come the Double Deckers. Those in the room who are part of the Generation Z will probably have no idea what I'm talking about. Just ask your mum and dad. To break it down for you quickly, a bunch of diverse working class kids hanging out in a scrapyard with their own double-decker bus getting into constant trouble and adventures. Trust me, it was big. How and when they got the bus, I do not know. I just went with it. One of the characters was a young teenage black boy called Spring, played by Brinsley Ford, more famously know, now known as a member of the reggae group Aswad. Which brings me to moment number two. I was of the generation where my family would be so excited to see a black person on television. From the living room, either my mum or my big brother would roar from the top of their voice, black person on the telly. <laughs> as soon as the rest of us heard that, we would all stop whatever it was we were doing and come charging in to gather around the television set. Now, I saw plenty of black people who looked and sounded like my mother and her generation. Call them the Windrush generation, if you like but nowhere near enough, if any at all, were there any black people who looked and sounded like me and were of the same age. It was not until 1978, when I arrived home from school, having my dinner in the kitchen, when I first heard the famous opening theme tune to some brand new children's TV series that was called Grange Hill. To the Generation Z in the room again, please tell me you have at least heard of that show. <laughs> Good, thank you. Grain Jewel began its very first episode with the opening shot of a young black boy going by the name of Benny Green entering the school with a football under his arm, being yelled at by some bigoted school caretaker. My jaw had dropped to the floor when I saw him, when I heard him. There he was. Not only had I saw a black person, but I saw a black person that was the same age as me and looked and sounded like me. It encouraged me to think back to the Double Deckers with Brinsley Ford's character Spring. Both he and the character of Benny Green made me feel represented. Moment number three. I was 15 years old in the last year of school. Myself and the entire year were visited by our career teachers, offering us advice on what our future plans were once we had left. But none of us were encouraged to think big or consider staying on for sixth form to do our A-levels. We were all working class kids, black, white, Asian. The majority of us lived in neighboring council estates across West London. University, not for the likes of us. One day in class, we were asked to fill in a form and list what our ambitions were. I wrote down what I wanted to be, a playwright, scriptwriter. The teacher then held up my form to use an example of a boy getting it wrong. This boy wants to be a scriptwriter. That is not very realistic. There is a twist to this tale. That teacher herself was black. For the next eight years, I believed that teacher was right. I looked around, but there wasn't anyone who looked like me, who sounded like me, to tell me I could be a writer. But I could not stop thinking about Benny Green, about Brinsley Ford. And by that time, the end of the 80s, and beginning of the 90s, there were many other faces to inspire me. Gary Beadle, Lenny James, Clint Dyer, Joanne Campbell, Kathy Tyson, Brian Bavell, Lenny Henry, Donna Kroll, Eamon Walker, Paul J. Medford. There were writers as well, 
Alan Clark, Barry Keith, Nigel Williams, Noel Gregg, Horace Ove, Michael Abensetz, Mustafa Matura, Winston Pinnock, Trish Cook. A lot of those names may not mean much to you, but their existence meant everything to me. I was 21 years old, unemployed, living at home, having to force myself in my mind to raise the proverbial middle finger to that teacher and say, not very realistic. Do you want to bet on that? I do not hold any ill will to that teacher. I mean, trying to handle a classroom of almost 30 rowdy boys is something I would not wish on anyone. But it's not hard for me to argue that perhaps that teacher should have known better because of their ethnicity. So, why, I'm, why am I sharing all of this with you today? Because representation and visibility is essential. I would not be here speaking to you today if it wasn't. For anyone here who feels marginalized, to be fully seen is a feeling we're all rarely afforded. To know that it's possible, to be shown as well and told that it is possible is absolutely key. We need more diversity, not just in your amazing, incredible work, but everywhere in life. Your work should be told. Your work should have something to say, however you wish to say it. Please forgive me if it sounds like I'm telling you all the bleeding obvious, because surely you don't need me to help you look around, to have a glance through the window of our insane world at the moment. Of course you don't. But life is so tough right now, in so many ways. Worldwide, people are being unspeakably cruel to one another. And those who have the economic and political power to make life better seem to be the cruelest of all. But to all of the artists in the room, you are the refuge from it all. You are the tribe. You are the touchstone. You are the safe space. You are the dangerous space. Because you all take whatever it is that you believe in and you put it out there so everyone else can see it with so much risk. Because of course, all art must run the risk of being seen to be bad. Otherwise, it cannot be art. None of that is easy, I know. And when it goes wrong, it's hard to take. That I also know from personal experience. But we do it anyway. We do it for the same reason that we are called artists to begin with, because we do not know how not to be artists. Because you and your voice, however you decide to use it, is needed. You will be taken for granted. You will be unfairly criticized. You will not win every single award, but you will always be needed. We are living in such awful, uncertain times that it's doing an excellent job in making us all feel that is not the case but it is. Whether the powers that be accept it or not, it is. We are needed. They can cut arts to the bone as much as they like, and they will. But we are here, and we are needed. We can rest, take a breath, but we must not quit. So, always be joyous about your work. Always be provocative about your work. Always question, be what you cannot see. I would like to end, as I began, with Langston Hughes. I've been scarred and battered, my hopes the wind unscattered, snow has frizzed me, sun has baked me. Looks like between them, they done try to mate me. Stop laughing, stop loving, stop living. But I don't care, I'm still here. Thank you. Woo!